Hello everyone, welcome to this lecture. So, now for the next few lectures I will be discussing cryptographically secure uh, multiparty computation. So, there are several ways to uh, design cryptographically secure multiparty computation uh, based on the underlying primitives. So, we can base the protocol on threshold encryption schemes, we can base the protocol on fully homomorphic encryption schemes, we can base the protocol on garbling schemes and so on. But I, I will be discussing a simpler approach for designing cryptographically secure uh, multiparty computation based on commitment schemes. So, to understand the commitment schemes, we have to quickly uh, go through cyclic groups and the discrete logarithm problem. So, <coughs> let us start with the group exponentiation operation. So, let G be a group and without loss of generality, I assume that the underlying operation is multiplicative, but it need not be the case. But whatever I am discussing here uh, holds even if the underlying group operation is additive. So, since I am considering a multiplicative group, I will be denoting the identity element by the notation 1. So, this should not be confused with the integer 1. Now, the group exponentiation operation for an element with respect to an element g is defined recursively as follows. We define g to the power 0 to be the identity element of the group. g to the power 1 is defined to be the group element g itself and now g to the power m for any m greater than equal to 2 is defined to be the result of the group operation being performed over the elements g and g to the power m minus 1. With respect to the negative powers, g power minus 1 is defined to be the inverse of the element g and <coughs> g to the power minus m for any m greater than equal to 2 is defined to be the result of the group operation being performed over the group elements g power minus 1 and g power minus of m minus 1. So, it is easy to see that the rules, the way we have defined the group exponentiation, the rules of integer exponentiations are applicable even for a group exponentiations. Namely, if I multi, if I apply the group operation on the elements g power m and g power n, then I will obtain the group element g to the power m plus n and so on. I also would like to stress here that we have efficient algorithms. We have efficient algorithms for performing group exponentiations. Okay. So, for instance, we can use the square and multiply approach which is a very nice algorithm square and multiply algorithm. Its description you can find in any standard text on number theory or you can refer to my um, course on discrete mathematics the NPTEL course on discrete mathematics or foundations of cryptography. Okay. Now, let us define cyclic groups. So, a group is called a cyclic group if you have a special element g in the group which is called as the generator and the speciality of this element is that you can generate all the elements of the group by computing different powers of the generator. So, in terms of notation, we use this uh, represent uh, notation here within the angular bracket, we write the generator which denotes that if I take the different powers of g starting from 0 and on 0 onwards, I will be able to generate all the elements of the group. So, it is not necessary that a cyclic group has a unique generator, it could have multiple generators. The, the, the definition for cyclic group uh, is that it should have at least one generator. So, let us see some examples of cyclic groups. If I take the set of 
integers with respect to the integer addition operation, then it constitutes a cyclic group where the element 1 will be the generator because you take any integer x negative positive, you can express that integer x as some k times the generator 1. That means, in terms of the generator you can represent each and every integer. Whereas, if we take a prime number p, then the set z p which is the set of elements 0, 1 up to p minus 1, then this set along with the operation addition modulo p. So, this is the operation of addition modulo p, it also constitutes a cyclic group of prime order. Prime order means the number of elements here will be a prime quantity namely p and then if we have a cyclic group of prime order then a nice feature of such groups is that uh, every element except the identity element 0 will be a generator of this cyclic group. Next let us uh, define the discrete logarithms in the context of cyclic groups. So, imagine you have a cyclic group whose order is q that means there are q number of elements in the group and again without loss of generality imagine that the group is multiplicative. Since the group is a cyclic group that means by computing the different powers of 0 starting from 0 up to q minus 1, uh, I, can, I, I can generate all the elements of the group. Now, suppose I take any arbitrary element of the group, since it is a group element, it can be expressed as a power of the generator. So, there will be some unique power x in the range 0 to q minus 1 such that g to the power x is going to be that arbitrary element y. Then this unique power x in the range 0 to q minus 1 is considered as the discrete logarithm of y with respect to the generator and we denote it by d log of y to the base g. So, it is very similar to our natural logarithm in the for the natural logarithms we know that if a to the power x is equal to y then we say that log of y to the base a is x. You can imagine that discrete logarithm is similar to our natural logarithm in the discrete world in the context of a cyclic world. Like natural logarithms discrete logarithms also obey some nice properties. So, <coughs> we know that log of 1 to the base a is 0 because a to the power 0 is defined to be 1. In the same way the discrete logarithm of the identity element of the group with respect to the generator is 0 because remember that we have defined g to the power 0 to be the identity element of the group. In the same way if we take an element h and raise it to the power r, it will be a group element because the group satisfies the closure property. Now, if we want to take, if we want to compute the discrete logarithm of this new element h to the power r, that will be same as r times the discrete logarithm of h. Now, r times discrete logarithm of h might be a value which crosses q minus 1. So, to ensure that the resultant value is in the range 0 to q minus 1, we have to take a mod q because as per the definition of discrete log, it should be the it is the unique power x in the range 0 to q minus 1. In the same way, if you want to compute the discrete logarithm of the product of two elements then it will be same as the summation of the discrete logarithms of the individual elements. In general, if you are given an arbitrary element y such that y is equal to g to the power x for any integer x may not be in the range 0 to q minus 1, then a discrete logarithm of y in the range 0 to q minus 1 can be obtained by computing x modulo q. So, these are some standard properties of discrete logarithms. I am not going into the proof for these properties. Uh, 
I will be telling you the references which you can follow in, want, in case you want to go through the proof of these properties. Now, how difficult or easy it is to compute the discrete log of a arbitrary given number. Okay. So, imagine you are given a cyclic group whose order is q such that the number of bits required to represent the value q is n. So, this notation this denotes the number of or it denotes the size of q in terms of bits that means q is a n bit number. That does not mean there are n elements in the group, there are q elements in a group g where q is represented by n bit n bits. So, that means the magnitude of q is roughly 2 to the power n that means my group size is exponentially large here. Now, imagine I give you a generator and a random element from the group I stress a random element it is not a fixed element of the group. Now, since my group g is a cyclic group and g is a generator there will be a discrete logarithm of y. So, I would like to compute the discrete logarithm of y with respect to the generator and I prefer an algorithm where the number of operations is polynomial in n namely the size of group elements. Okay. So, there is of course, a brute force discrete log solver and that brute force algorithm will do the following. It will go over every possible value for the discrete logarithm starting from 0 all the way to q minus 1 and checks whether g to the power x is equal to y or not. Of course, the discrete logarithm of y will be a value in the range 0 to q minus 1 and that is precisely this algorithm is exploiting. Okay. So, this algorithm will definitely give you the output, but what is the running time of this algorithm? The running time of this algorithm is order of q. You should not say that this is a polynomial time algorithm because q in terms of magnitude is 2 power n. So, the running time of this algorithm increases exponentially as the magnitude of q increases. So, this is definitely not a preferred algorithm. The question is does there exist a better algorithm than this naive brute force discrete log solver. The answer is yes, but not always. So, there are certain cyclic groups where we can get where, where we can use better algorithms in fact, efficient algorithms to compute the discrete logarithm for a random number without doing the brute force. So, for instance, if I take the cyclic group Z p where the operation is addition modulo p, then we have better algorithms, but at the same time there are certain candidate cyclic groups where as of today we do not have any better algorithm, no efficient algorithm to be more precise other than this brute force algorithm or even if we have alternate algorithms their worst case running time ends up to be asymptotically order of 2 power n or order of group size. Okay. So, for instance one such candidate cyclic group is the group Z p star. So, Z p star is the set 1 to p minus 1 and the operation here multiplication modulo p. Of course, there are some other better candidate cyclic groups for which it is conjectured that we do not have any better algorithm whose running time is better than this order of 2 power n. So, based on this discussion we formulate now the discrete logarithm problem and the d log assumption. So, an instance of d log problem is basically to efficiently compute the discrete logarithm of a given random group element. and the difficulty of the d log problem, the difficulty of solving the d log problem is uh, formalized by 
an experiment. We call that experiment as the D log experiment which is parameterized with respect to an adversary and a group G where the size of the group is exponentially large in N and the problem instance is created as follows. So, we have two entities here the experiment where which is modeled by uh, some hypothetical verifier and an adversary. Now, this experiment or the verifier it picks a random index in the range 0 to q minus 1. It can be done easily and then it gives the group element g power alpha to the adversary. So, the discrete logarithm of this element g to the power alpha is alpha which is known to this experiment. Now, the challenge for this adversary is to compute a discrete logarithm for this value u. Notice that the value u is going to be a random element in the group. Now, the adversary is allowed only polynomial time here. So, PPT here denotes probabilistic polynomial time. So, adversary simply cannot run the brute force algorithm which we had discussed earlier. It is free to use any other algorithm as long as its running time is polynomial time and in polynomial time it has to submit a response to the experiment. We say that the adversary has won the experiment or the output of the experiment is 1. So, the output of the experiment being 1 denotes that the adversary has won the experiment and the adversary has won the experiment if and only if it has computed the discrete logarithm correctly. That means, whatever is the response submitted by the adversary g to the power that response is equal to the random element which the experiment has chosen. Now, what is the D log assumption? Informally D log assumption means that it is difficult for any adversary to win an instance of D log mo modeled by the above experiment in that group. Formally we say that the discrete log assumption holds in the group. If for every polynomial time adversary who participates in the above experiment, the probability that it can when the experiment is upper bounded by some negligible quantity. That means, except with a negligible probability the adversary will fail to win the experiment. We are giving here some negligible advantage to the adversary to win the experiment because a simple strategy for the adversary to win the experiment could be to just guess the value of the discrete logarithm. Okay. For that adversary does not have to do any sophisticated task, it just has to guess a value alpha prime and there is always a non-zero probability that the alpha prime guessed by the adversary turns out to be the discrete logarithm. Okay. It turns out that there are several candidate cyclic proofs where discrete logarithm is conjectured to be difficult that means, d log assumption holds in those proofs, but again it is just a conjecture we do not have any formal proof as of now. Even after trying for several years as of today we do not have any efficient algorithm to solve an instance random instance of discrete log problems in those groups. So, with that I end this lecture. So, these are the references which you can follow to know more about uh, discrete logarithms, cyclic groups and so on. You can either refer to my NPTEL lectures on foundations of cryptography or my NPTEL lectures on discrete mathematics. Thank you.